When we study the Holocaust, we learn about the extermination of the Jewish people, the murder of six million Jews at the hands of the Nazis. But there's another part of the story that many people don't know about, the Nazi theft and destruction of Jewish culture. Not only did the Nazis want to exterminate the Jews, but they also wanted to destroy the memory of their culture as well. As the Nazis tried to make the world Judenfrei, or free of Jews, they would also build an institute for the investigation of the Jewish question, a center to study and document the culture of the people they destroyed, with artifacts from that culture proving they acted justly. Located in Frankfurt, they planned to stock the institute with rare Jewish books, ritual objects, and more. They even had a division known as Einsatzstab Rosenberg specifically tasked to commit these acts of cultural plunder to rob museums and libraries of their rare works. Shortly after the start of Operation Barbarossa, when the Germans attacked the Soviet Union in the summer of 1941, the Nazis occupied the city of Vilna. Vilna, now Vilnius, the capital of Lithuania, was an epicenter of Jewish culture. Known as the Jerusalem of Lithuania or the Jerusalem of the North, it was for centuries a major center of traditional Jewish learning and religious life. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the city also saw a blossoming of modern secular Yiddish culture with an outpouring of new Yiddish literature and journalism, as well as theater of all kinds. It was this mix of Jewish tradition and modernity that made Vilna the perfect city for an organization like YIVO to take root. So YIVO was founded in 1925 in Vilna as an academic center for the study of Jewish life and Jewish culture. Its founders wanted to study Jewish history and culture from a Jewish perspective and to elevate Yiddish language and culture through world-class scholarship. At the time, Yiddish was the language of approximately 80% of the world's Jews. Other na nations had their own national academies, elevating their languages and cultures through academic work. So too, argued YIVO's founders, should the millions of Jews living in Eastern Europe and its diasporas. With centuries of Jewish tradition, Vilna was the ideal home for YIVO. Not far from the YIVO building, with its modern, forward-looking architecture, was the famous Strashun Library, the greatest Jewish library in Eastern Europe, which contained thousands of volumes of rare books and manuscripts. So when the Nazis arrived in Vilna in 1941, Einsatzstab Rosenberg had a list, and on it were both YIVO and the Strashun Library. They took over the YIVO building and made it the headquarters for their plundering operation. But they had a problem. Who could sort and catalog these rare books? They needed experts in Jewish languages to determine what was the most valuable. So they assembled a group of Jewish poets and intellectuals and forced them into slave labor, demanding they sort through Vilna's treasures of Jewish culture. Among these laborers were Zelig Kalmanovich, Yivo's co-director, and two poets, Shmerke Kaczerginski and Avram Sutzkiver. From 1925 to 1941, Yivo had collected nearly a million books and artifacts from around the world that told the story of Jewish life. The Strashen Library had thousands of rare Hebrew books, some centuries old. After occupying Vilna, the Nazis forced the city's Jews into a ghetto and started the process of exterminating them, and at the same time began looting their culture. Every day, these slave laborers would walk from the ghetto to the Evo building, which was located outside the ghetto, to sort the materials the Nazis wanted and pack them into crates for shipment to Germany, then return to the ghetto. The group of labor soon realized that the Nazis planned to destroy materials that were of no interest to them. These included the, culture, the Jewish cultural materials that YIVO had spent the previous 15 years collecting. They therefore made the decision to risk their lives by trying to rescue as much of these rare Jewish materials as they could. Zela Kalmanovich was convinced that the Nazis would lose the war and the crates they were sending to Germany would be recovered by the Allies. So he and the others began slipping materials the Nazis didn't want into the crates with the materials that they did. Kaczerginski and Sutzkever and other Jewish laborers began a more dangerous method. They hid materials underneath their clothing and smuggled them into the ghetto where they hid them in underground bunkers, behind walls and beneath floorboards. If caught, they all faced almost certain death. The ghetto guards gave those who smuggled materials into the ghetto a nickname, the Paper Brigade, because while other ghetto inmates smuggled food or valuables, Members of the paper brigade risked their lives to save rare books and manuscripts. They understood while they themselves might not survive the war, their daring acts of cultural preservation would serve others for generations to come. Most of those active in the paper brigade eventually perished at the hands of the Nazis, whether during the liquidation of the Vilna ghetto or soon thereafter in concentration camps. Sutzkever and Kaczerginski managed to escape the ghetto before its liquidation. They joined the partisans in the forests and fought the Nazis. As soon as the war was over, the two poets returned to Vilna to recover the materials they had buried. 
They opened a small Jewish museum, but soon realized the materials were in danger once again, as the Soviets now controlled Vilna. So they risked their lives once more, smuggling the material past the Soviets through Poland to safer cities like Paris, and eventually to New York, where Ivo had officially moved in 1940. Kalmanovich was also prescient in his method. The crates packed for the Nazis were recovered by the U.S. Army's monuments men in an enormous warehouse outside of Frankfurt after the war. Through the efforts of Max Weinreich, one of Ivo's founders and then director, the Ivo materials were shipped to New York City, where they remain today. Sutskever and Katraginsky were not able to smuggle all the buried materials. Some of them remained in Vilna, hidden by a brave Lithuanian librarian named Antonis Ulpis in the basement of a church. This hidden cache was only exposed as the Soviet Union began to crumble in the late 1980s. In 2017, another cache of 170,000 documents was discovered hidden in Vilnius. Through the Edward Blank Yivo Vilna Online Collections, a project to digitize all of Yivo's pre-war collections, these materials are being reunited virtually for the first time, and the work to save them for future generations continues.